in math and physics, and also had graduate studies at the American University and University of Virginia in math and physics. In 1963 and 1965, he taught at Montgomery College, Maryland Math, Physics, Astronomy, and was the planetarium director. In 1965, he joined NASA to work for the Manned Flight, Flight Division of the Godard Space Flight Center on the Gemini and Apollo projects for the trip to the moon. In 1969, he joined the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, to work in information management systems. He officially retired early in 1987 for consulting work. He provided consulting services in information management systems and telecommunications for six U.S. government departments. In addition, he offered his services to municipal governments such as Philadelphia and in some Ohio counties and Montgomery County, Maryland. Some of his private industry clients, employers, included multinational companies such as Lockheed International, Northrop Grumman, and AT&T, among others. He participated in many Washington, D.C. area organizations to promote the image of the Greek American community and his positive contributions to the American society and supported fundraising activities for churches and education. In 1963, he co-founded the Reverend Thomas Daniels Daily Parochial School in Washington, D.C. that functioned well for 30 years. In 1976, he participated in an all-day White House conference on ethnicity and education with 67 other participants nationwide as chairman of the Montgomery and Prince George's Counties, Maryland Ethnic Studies Committee, representing 21 ethnic minorities. In 1974, he participated as a Washington, D.C. community leader to promote the cause of Cyprus and raised funds for the people of Cyprus. In 1978, he attended the U.S. State Department Conference for Human Rights, representing the Greek Americans national, nationwide among 500 participating American organizations to defend the religious freedom of the Greek Orthodox Patriarch. Since 2017, Demetrius has been a member on the governing board of Hellenic American Culture Center of Portland, Oregon, and Southwest Washington. For the last 20 years, he has continued to be interviewed, interested in the Greek diaspora worldwide and in the cultural interactions of Greek culture with other cultures worldwide for the last 4,000 years. Dimitri has been listed in the Marquis Who's Who in the South and Southwest in 1971, Community Leaders in America in 1968, the Dictionary of International Biography, London, England, 1970, and Demetrius has been happily married to Christine for over 60 years, and for the last seven years they have lived happily here in Portland, Oregon. He has quite a story. <laughs> a lot of accomplishments, Demetri. Anyway, I will turn this over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. great pleasure to be with you tonight and I'm very happy to cover a very interesting subject which has to do with the Greek immigrant work, work experience in America in the early 1900s. Of course, although we'll talk about the experience of the Greek Americans, primarily who will include foreigners from other countries who were immigrants as well as many American-born workers in the same facilities wherever the Greek immigrants were. This is very important. It's not only about the Greek immigrants, it's about American labor and how they live and how they work and how they were compensated and what conditions they perform their work. This is very important. Well, basically, who will cover the labor unrest in many places in America. And in particular, we'll start from our neighbor, the state of Washington, and then we'll mention what was written in publications in the state of Washington about 
Greek labor immigrants as well as foreign immigrants. And then we'll visit the state of Oregon, right here. And at the end, we'll go throughout the country and we'll cover the Triangle Third Wave Factory Third Wave Factory Fire of March 25, 1911, in New York City, because there we'll see the important conditions under which those employees, immigrants, and Americans were working. Then we'll go to Lawrence, Massachusetts, textile strike in 1912, and there you will see how 10,000 women demonstrated not losing a pay of 32 cents a week. In other, words, in other words, their employers wanted to reduce their pay, and they demonstrated 10,000 of them for 32 cents reduction that to take place. And finally, we'll cover the Ludlow Massacre in Colorado, which was a unique situation in 1914 because it was a milestone in the annals of the United Mine Workers of America as well as in the labor movement in the United States. Now, at the beginning, as you would expect, the Greek immigrants were not adequately prepared to come to this country and to confront the life they really had to face. The new immigrant was willing to do any work without having experience, and he expected to overcome any hardships that would make a front The immigrant, usually a single man, thought he could survive under any conditions. He lacked familiarity with life in the new world, and he was not prepared to face all these new challenges of work, at work, as well as off work, and he also lacked education because he was not speaking the English language and that definitely increased his hardships. His social and business environment was a lot more complicated than the simple life he was used to in his own village. He lacked the ability to communicate with his workers on the job, most of whom were immigrants from many foreign countries. The early immigrant thought earning money was much easier than he had anticipated, and his living expenses were greater than he had expected. In addition, many of the early Greek immigrants had an additional burden of having to pay off the debt to pay for their trip coming to the new country. The patron system began in the towns of Italy and spread to America. The Immigration Act of 1864 encouraged many people who were not really adequately prepared to work in a foreign country to come to this country. Because of that, the patron system was in early America a labor system or practice for many new immigrants that exploited their inability to move with la where labor was available because they didn't know the language and they didn't have any business contacts to find the new jobs. The literacy rate of the Greeks around 1900 was 27%. And it was reduced to 4% around 1920 because compulsory education in Greece became mandatory in the year 1911. The patron system was common in many areas in the western states and in the big cities. This practice was dominant in coal mining, shoeshine business in the big cities, in fruit, vegetable, and flower peddling as well. An immigrant that had arrived earlier in the U.S. would arrange with local employers to recruit new immigrants in Greece by providing their travel expenses and secure them a job in a new country and having his fees deducted directly from the employer by the employer from the workers' pay. Now let's talk about some labor unrest in many places in America. I chose selected cases of labor problems around the country 
because I wanted to present the unfair treatment of the employees with inadequate compensation as well as with unacceptable work environment conditions. Most companies in many industries in America were primarily interested in maximizing profits and spend a minimum of resources to pay their employees and for a safe and healthy workplace environment. For example, the coal miners had to provide their own tools for the job and get paid by the time of coal they delivered to the company, usually 50 cents per ton, with no compensation for their time for using explosives to clear parts in the mine. Whenever a mine explosion took place, the first question the company foreman would ask was, how many courses did we lose? If an employee was killed during the working hours, the mine workers had to continue their work while the killed employee was set aside until the end of the work day. The company would only notify his family, the family of the deceased, at the end of the work day. The company would never allow the workers to spend any time during working hours to notify the family or take care of the dead employee. Mine workers were considered a resource that can be replaced with ease. Organized labor tried to improve the working conditions for the workers by fighting for better wages, reasonable hours, and safer working conditions. In addition, labor unions were instrumental in stopping child labor, earn health benefits, and provide aid to retired and or injured workers. However, it took many decades for the organized labor to achieve that. Let's talk about the state of Washington, our neighbor. First of all, I want to thank Ms. Katharina Adeline of Yakima, Washington, who provided me with accurate information on Greek immigrant population in the state of Washington, as well as with excellent newspaper reference resources with information on labor arrest in the state of Washington in the early 1900s. According to the centimeters of Seattle, Washington Greek community history, Nicholas George and George Tandu Nicholas are the first Greek settlers of Seattle. They arrived in 1885 on a fishing schooner that traveled around Cape Horn. You see, Panama Canal was built in 1914, so they had to go all the way around Cape Horn to get here. The number of Greek immigrants in the state of Washington around 1900 was only about 65 persons. By 1910, about 4,177 Greeks came to Washington State. About 93 of them had two parents who were Greek, and 46 children had one Greek parent. The Industrial Workers of America Union was established in Chicago in 1905 as an international labor union to organize foreign workers because the AFL would not organize non-American foreign workers. The IWW members were known as Wobblies. On November 2, 1909, the IWW organized a demonstration for the right of free speech in Spokane, Washington. On the first day, 103 demonstrators were arrested, and by the end of the month, their number reached 500. The issue was later resolved in court in favor of the workers, and I gave the right of the union to try to recruit new members. In 1910, in Hokiam City, the majority of the Greeks worked in the sawmills, while the Greeks living in the outlying areas of the, of the county worked on, on the railroad. About 111 worked on railroad jobs in that particular city, 71 on sawmill jobs, 16 as laborers, and one was a shoemaker. The Yakima Labor Republic, on March 28, 1912, in the headline Labor and Rest in Coal Cities report, Aberdeen and Hokiam are likely to be involved in labor issues all summer. 
IWW strikes have already caused 10 sawmills to shut down. The city of Aberdeen tried to expel the IWW union as agitators, and their effort resulted in a strike. We have some more young Kigma publications reporting on labor issues in 1912. Many of the workers in Lewis County were Greeks and demanded a $2.50 pay day, pay per day instead of $2 pay that they were getting. The mailmen refused to increase their pay. About 10,000 new workers went on strike and 25% of those striking workers were members of the IWW. The Finnish Board Finance, which is a publication published by the Finnish American Historical Society of the West on March 20, 1912, reported from South Bend, Washington. The headline reads, Harbor Labor Industry Menaced by IWW Agitators. By Wednesday, every summit in the city has been closed down. The sheriff and his deputies raided Finn Hall in Raymond, the union meeting place, arrested nearly a dozen strikers and locked them up in jail. In addition, the Greek pool hall and the grocery store where the Greek strikers were congregating were closed by order of the mayor and the police. They were determined to drive the strikers out of the city and keep them away forever. The same Publication reported on 20, 1912 from South Bend, Washington, the headline, Retaining Greeks Again Are Driven Out. Last Saturday afternoon, a crowd of 35 striking Finns were hustled out of town, and they were placed aboard a steamer for Astoria. The same morning, about 150 Greeks were placed aboard the outgoing train to Sehalis. About 40 of them tried to return Sunday afternoon but they were not allowed to. About 200 citizen police confronted the train at Walapa and they drove them as far as Mongo. They have not since returned. Millmen arranged to bring in men of family, that means married workers, and they paid them higher wages than they were paying the foreigners before. It was interesting. They didn't want to allow they didn't want to, uh, to increase the pay of their employees. Once they went on strike, they were willing to pay newcomers for the higher pay. The South Bend Journal of April 15, 1912, reported in the headline, Agitators banished from Raymond the following. The Greeks and the Finns were caught out and about 50 Finns were shipped out by a boat to Nahota from where most of them went to Astoria, except a few of them who returned to Raymond on Monday morning. About 150 Greeks were about to be placed on boxcars packed like sardines, but the railroad company refused to take them all. And those people had already paid for their tickets, and the railroad company did not let them board the train. They were heavily escorted by deputies. When the Greeks reached Centralia, they were met by the Greek consul, of course, Mr. Hans Hayden of Tacoma, Washington, an American lawyer who was a business lawyer working for the mill companies. We have some more information on the Aberdeen Daily World of 1911 and 1912. On November 14, 1911, a large exodus of Greeks, Italians, and Finns is taking place who have withdrawn their savings from the banks, in particular the postal bank. November 9, 2011, Aberdeen citizens keep law and order. Professional men and workers from all walks of life are armed with business like hickory wagons, folks, and axe handles. On March 15, 1912, Americans may take places of Greek strikers. Yesterday, the mills were temporarily shut down after 150 Greeks walked out of the two mills. March 25, 1911, all American labor, now plan of the mill owners. They thought they would try not to employ ever foreign workers. 
Former were given instructions to hire only family men. On April 16, 1912, mills ready to start. Minimum wage was at 250 per day for the lowest pay for English-speaking laborers who had no experience. On April 8, 1912, from the editorial page, to read, when the Greek saw the struggle here was going against him, he left. He does not care about this community. He spent out of his earnings, uh, earnings I'm sorry, a little, as little as he could and sent the rest back to his native land. His wife and children are not here. It is declared that there are only six Greek families in Aberdeen. The Greek immigrant. He lived here 10 or 12 in one room and actually saved money out of that $2 per day pay. On April 9, 1912, Chamber asks investigation of false reports. A.L. Davenport reported that certain correspondents from Portland, Seattle, and Tacoma newspapers are coloring stories sent out on the strike situation here, and in some cases are falsifying the information. He also announced that 100 working men with their families are en route to seek positions, and we need to cooperate with finding them homes. On June 3, 1912, the court refuses citizenship to two IWW men. Judge Mason Erwin at the Superior Court of Montesanto refused to grant naturalization papers to two IWW members. One of them was George Jacob Kiriakotopoulos, a Greek of Aberdeen. The judge asked him to apply again, and for which he had to wait for another five years to go to court and get American citizens. Let's see what was happening right here in Oregon. Portland Lumber and Sawmill Strike. Mill and wool workers strike in Portland, Oregon on March 1, 1907. The strike was organized by IWW, about 2,000 lumber workers demanding a wage increase. Most Portland mills closed. However, the mill owners, the AFL, and other local unions cooperated to keep the mills open using non-union workers. While the striking workers did not get any pay raise, their working conditions were improved. I'll mention a few more cases. And actually, there was twice as many reports on the Oregon papers than to have displayed here. On March 19, 1907, IWW workers called a strike in the United Engineering Company of Portland. They prevented any strike breakers to break the strike, and the company satisfied their demands within four hours by offering them a 30 cent pay increase. They couldn't get anybody else to work there. The, the workers made sure nobody would break the lines. On October 8, 1910, IWW supported three strikes of bridge workers in Portland. It successfully managed to get them a pay raise from $2.25 to $3 per day, and a sort of work day from 10 hours per day to 9 hours per day. One of the most important U.S. Supreme Court cases in the Progressive Era was the case of Mueller versus Oregon in 1908 where the court upheld the Oregon law for women to work only 10 hours per day. The court emphasized the need to protect women's health in the Supreme Court by avoiding overwork for medical reasons for potential mothers. The case appeared in court because Hans Kurt Miller, the owner of the Grand Laundry, demanded that Emma Gatcher, a unionist and the wife of a union leader, work longer than 10 hours, which was the allowable maximum limit according to the state of work.
Now we'll go to the state of New York. The Tango Shed Waste Factory Fire of March 25 was the deadliest industrial disaster in the history of New York City. The fire broke out in the top floors of a 10-story Shed Waste Factory building in the government district of Greenwich Village in New York City on March 25, 1911. The factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of the building. The firemen arrived at the 10-story building, but the lattice was shot. The owners get locked doors leading to stairwells and exits, the common practice at the time, because they were afraid the employees would waste time or try to steal some of the merchandise and get out through those doors. Thus, the workers were trapped inside. Many of them jumped from the windows to their death from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor. The fire was over in half an hour. About 146 workers, of the total of 500, were dead. Most of them were women. Most of the dead women were Italian or Jewish, which they arrived women and girls, ranging in ages from the age of 14 to 23. After three years, the company agreed in a court case to compensate only 21 of the 146 workers who died and and only paid $75 for each person without admitting any guilt with the excuse that the company owners were unaware of the closed doors in the fire. Today, the building is used for instruction classes at the New York University. The fire helped legislation to pass requiring improved factory safety standards and assisted in the growth of the International Ladies' Carmen Workers' Group. This strike occurred in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912. The Lawrence textile industry employed 32,000 workers, most of whom were women. What happened was on January 1912, the state of Massachusetts voted for a 54 hour work week. They were working for 56 hours. So the middlemen thought, okay, we'll cut. 32 cents from their pay. When the, when, the women, when the women got their paycheck on January 11, they noticed they were missing 32 cents. Well, 32 cents was the price of three loaves of bread. And to those poor people, it was a lot. So now we have 10,000 women working on strike to try to keep their 32 cents. It wasn't a pay raise. They did not want to get a pay cut. Many laborers took up collections and local farmers brought fruit and vegetables to them. Many women, because it was striking for over a month until the month of February, they sent their kids to some cities like Boston and New York, and people offered to take care of the children while the mothers were on strike. The American Woolen Company, the largest employer in town with four textile mills in New Orleans, employed even children under the age of 14 by falsifying birth certificates for many girls. Half of the employees were women between the ages of 14 and 23. About one third of the workers in Lawrence textile mills died before the ages of 25. The city of Lawrence had the highest mortality rate of any city in the country behind four other towns, Lowell, Fall River, Worcester, and Hoyle. There were many Greek immigrant women working in those mills. There were as many as 50 on nationalities among those workers. Ann Laro is a historic preservation planner for the city of New Bedford, describing the textile mill for conditions. With machinery running, it would have been loud, it would have been hot, it would have been dusty, 
she said. There were cotton bits flying everywhere, you know. There are big cotton and remnants all over the floors. And full of people because there were three seats running 24-7. These mills attracted many young women eager to escape the rural life in early America. Many were from French Canadians from Quebec, or immigrants from Ireland, England, Greece, or Poland. In fact, my own mother-in-law and her sister were among those women in the city of New Bedford, which at the time had the highest number of mills in the country, and they were producing so many millions uh, of square yards of textiles that they had the highest per capita income than any other city in the world. The IWW tried to organize the employees and succeeded in their effort. The goals of the strike were 54-hour work week, 15% pay raise, double pay for overtime, and no bias for striking workers. The strike lasted for 10 weeks, and the workers succeeded to the surprise of the textile mill owners, who consented, surprisingly, to a 20% pay raise and improvement of the work environment. On March 14, 1912, 15,000 of the 32,000 employees approved the agreement. This was the strike that shook America. It was also known as the Bread and Roses strike because the women were really demonstrating for three loaves of bread to avoid the pay cut. And they used the term roses because the women were not respected at the jobs and they demanded while demonstrating that they, were, that they want their employers and the managers to really have a better respect for them. And that's what the word roses is there for. There were 10,000 women leading the strike. At the beginning, actually, many men did not, did not want to join us. I want to parade with women. Of course, later they joined them. And of course, in that strike, there were about three deaths, many injuries, and about 296 arrests. Here is the, strike, uh, the strikers walk downtown Lawrence, Massachusetts. 1912. Mother Jones, also the very famous social advocate for many employees who worked for, I mean, women workers throughout the United States, she was also in that parade. There's another photo here from that parade. Here are the, the Massachusetts militia. Uh, confront the strikers. Here are the children that were sent to New York City of the mothers that were striking. Now we come to the Ludlow Massacre in Colorado in April 20, 2014. The black leader Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without demands. You got a demand to get what you want, otherwise the boss is not going to offer it. In September 1913, about 11,000 coal miners went on strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron Corporation owned by John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his father, the senior, who was the patriarch of the Rockefeller family. Whatever John Rockefeller wanted, he always got it. He was Mr. America. Just to get an idea how powerful he was, his wealth at that time, in 2023 dollars, would have been 400 billion. Elon Musk is only 165 billion. He's the richest man in the world now. So you can imagine how rich he was. In fact, a few years later, they broke his monopoly. The first antitrust law that was passed. The Colorado National Guard faced the strikers 
later on April 29, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson ordered federal soldiers to the area to face the coal miners in what is known as the 1913-1914 Colorado Coal Field War. They estimated about a minimum of 69 people were killed in that war. This war was the bloodiest war in the United States after the American Civil War. This war didn't take place only in the war, it took place in the entire southern Colorado. There were 11,000 miners. What caused the strike? It was the desire of the coal miners to improve their lives by making the following demands. They wanted to work an eight-hour day, six days a week, get paid in U.S. currency and not in company script money. And they wanted to shop in other stores, not just in the company store for their needs. You could always, you could always use script money at the company store, but you couldn't go anywhere else to buy anything with it. It was just a piece of paper. After many months, the company wanted to end the strike, ignoring their demands. The company had not paid in full due wages to the strikers for months in order to force them through starvation to return to work. People had to borrow money from friends and relatives to survive. The company called for assistance. The Colorado governor called the National Guard to pacify the strikers. But really, they made up their mind to get rid of the, of the workers. There was no cooperation. The United Mine Workers of America, that was formed in 1890, supported the strike. In April 20, 1914, Louis Dickas, representing the United Mine Workers of America, a Greek from Lutra of Rethino Creek, Greece, while going back and forth negotiating with Major Patrick J. Hamrock, and he was about eight meters from the tent colony where the workers were living with their families in tents. He was shot in the back, and then twice again, three times, he got killed. He was 27 years old, and he was shot on, Mon on Easter Monday. April 19, 1914 was an Easter Sunday. For your information, the body of Louis Tikas was placed along the Colorado and Southern Railway tracks in full view for three days before the militia allowed the Union representatives to remove the body from burial. And when they had his burial at Trinity of Colorado, 15,000 15, coal miners attended the funeral. When the fighting started, women and children were hiding in underground places under the 1,200 person company in town for fear of their lives. The Colorado militia in the evening set the campfire of the coal miners on site, and the fire really devastated the entire facility. The blaze sucked the oxygen out of the underground places where the women and children were staying, and because of that, they died. About 25 of them died, and one of them was a woman and 11 year old children. The Colorado Massacre of 1914 was a milestone in the annals of the United Mine Workers of America. Louis Tickers was an outstanding union leader of the American labor movement in the early 20th century. He was intelligent and understanding of the needs and aspirations of the workers while a very skilled negotiator in dealing with the company owners. The Colorado Coalfield War was the bloodiest civil confrontation in the United States since the American Civil War. Here is an example of a family living next to her tent. And they're dressed up for the Easter, probably. There are more than one family. As you can see, the tents were next to each other. This entire facility housed 1,200 people. I'm 
sorry. Here is the Lago Colorado Massacre, yeah, and the Albi Memorial, the United Mine Workers of America Memorial. This is the devastation of the tent site in Colorado. Here is a picture of the of Louis Stick as the leader of the Colorado Massacre. I'm sorry, I can't get to the last page. In the conclusion, I have to say that Louis Stickers was quite a, an impressive young man. In fact, he used to have a coffee shop in Denver, Colorado, and he was very kind among the Greeks that there were customers at his place. And at one time they say a young man was attracted or in love with a young girl who spoke only English, and he didn't know any English, and he even offered to write a letter to the girl on behalf of that young gentleman. His Greek name was Elias Anastasios Fandidakis. In 2015, I had the opportunity with my wife to view a Colorado Ladmo Massacre video at the campus of the Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where I had the chance to meet some of the grandchildren of the striking coal miners in 1914, as well as relatives of the people who died in that disaster. I was moved because I thought I came face to face with the old history of the mine workers 100 years before, live, and I just like reading about it in some history book. Why did they perish without materializing their dreams to make a better life for their children? Were their demands excessive? Were the government representatives serving society or just the interests of a few persons? Are we to treat immigrants as lesser citizens in our society only if we share honorable objectives in our society we will be able to create a better community for our children and grandchildren. In conclusion, I want to emphasize that our children and grandchildren need to know how the Greek American community in our country was formed over 100 years ago and how our early Greek pioneer immigrants contributed with their blood, sweat, and tears to build the foundation of today's American society. Thank you. Well, I'm getting ready for the video. If you have any questions, sir. Dimitri, please ask them now. Okay. You want to ask them now? Yeah, and then we'll start the video. Go ahead and ask the question. Well, before the video? or Yeah, before the video. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Were Greeks involved in any way in the Centralia uh, violence of 1919? The, um, if you can recall. I do not know of it. I would have known because I've had lots called references and nothing like that. I had a question in my head. And second... The Ludlow Strikers to thank for that. They started the fight, they started the way. We, we, we need to watch this first that fight. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Were there problems with, okay, during World War One? the Greek community would have some reasons to uh, maybe not support the war effort because of their internationalism associated with the IWW. And then also for those who had time to reflect on such things, there was a link between the Greek uh, royal family and Bavaria. So were the Greeks uh, in reality are accused of being in support of the central powers? No, that's the opposite. The king of Greece was in support because the, the Kaiser was his brother-in-law. But the people in Greece were with Venizelos 
and the armed forces of Greece fought with the Allies. Alabama, Carolinas, and that. Did conditions change for the Greeks? There? Well, for many Greeks, really, the conditions didn't change much. And a lot of that work was done on uh, railroads, let's say. And in fact, at one time, like I, I would use a particular case where my wife in, 19, in 2015 visited Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama. And her father and her father's brother were working uh, on the railroad tracks, black race. Uh -huh. And they were living in a house, about eight or ten of them. And one time, the KKK came to confront them and supposedly to beat them up. But they were not hesitant. They broke the chairs of their own home. They cut the legs of the chairs. And they chased the KKK out, and they told the next time if you come here, we're not going to get you with a piece of wood. We're going to kill you. And never show you that. And that's a story from our company. Yeah. He was there. But they, they were not liked in the South either. The other side. No, they wouldn't take, they wouldn't, the Greeks would never take anybody to, to, to intimidate or to fight. That's the basic nature of the Greeks. Yeah. Any other stories questions? That there that there were such incidents here in Oregon with the KKK and Greeks. Yes. I've heard stories. When I was in Washington, I read a few uh, some items of information having to do with KKK in Oregon. Yes. Very strong. That's right. They were very strong at that time in the early 1900s. The KKK, I think, they had managed to influence and put in the house as many as about uh, 35 congressmen and four or five senators, so they had political power, too. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? I have a nugget for you. When I was a, a kid growing up in Connecticut, uh, in reference to that tragic textile fire in, uh, in the mid-50s, there was a textile fire in Connecticut, in the same exact conditions in New Haven. Well, yeah, basically, most of the factors, the conditions didn't change. And it's no wonder that they estimate that one third of the women died before the age of 25, because when you breathe all that yeah, cotton right. dust, you know, for years, that's, that's what's going to happen. Your lungs get filled up and you can't breathe. Any other questions? Thank you very much.